Okay, it's uh, about 10.03 here, so we're gonna get started. Thank you again for joining the LIEMO webinar um, uh, on running through data comparison. Uh, this is gonna highlight uh, our running MPIs, uh, which are motion performance indicators, uh, essentially our own innovative digital metrics that uh, are able to track various aspects of a runner's gait. Uh, my name is Brian Metzler. I'm in the, with the marketing department at Leomo. I'm a longtime runner. Uh, I do all types of running, uh, track, uh, roads, trails. Um, I was a middle distance runner a long time ago as a walk-on in college. Uh, I've also run 5Ks, 10Ks on the roads, marathons, of course, um, plus crazy stuff like Ironman, Leadman, and other ultra distance races. The photo to the right, obviously, is on the Great Wall of China. And um, all the connective uh, tissue of all this and all my running is that I'm a real running shoe geek and I have been for a long time. Um, I've been fascinated by running shoes since I was a kid, um, probably long before I understood what it all meant. Um, uh, over the last 20 years in my career, I've wear tested at least 1500 pairs. I think the number's higher by now. Um, and mostly with the media, um, in various uh, media brands I've either been a part of or I've started. Um, uh, to do wear test reviews, but also um, in some focus groups as well for brands or for other projects. Um, I also wrote a book uh, that published last fall, Kicksology, The Hype, Science, Culture, and Cool of Running Shoes, um, which is kind of a, uh, a way to tie all those stories in about all my experience with running shoes. Um, regarding today's uh, discussion, obviously, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a comparison of, of data about running shoes. And so, um, uh, it's been fascinating to me to understand kind of how runners move, how running form um, has always kind of, uh, you know, been understood, but certainly now looking at it with digital insights has been really kind of cool, um, especially from running shoes. Um, <clears throat> so this project is all about uh, testing three different types of shoes. Um, we, uh, the goal is basically to understand how a certain runner runs, that's me, differently in different pairs of shoes um, based on the data collected from our Leomo Type S and analyzed through our Leomo running motion performance indicators, our metrics. Um, we know that certainly every running shoe is constructed differently, so it makes sense that some shoes are better suited um, for a particular runner than others, um, and also potentially for other types of running. So for a marathon, for a half marathon versus a mile or uh, track workouts, intervals. Um, presently, running shoe comparisons in the media um, and running stores are done um, by simple wear testing, uh, certainly educated guesswork, um, and then treadmill running videos. Certainly there are some, you know, gurus we know as really good shoe fitters, um, but certainly they're using mostly analog um, and long time experience uh, kind of ideas of watching people move and run. Leoma Run technology offers a more precise solution uh, for the shoe, shoe fitting dilemma uh, because it gives the ability to see various parts of the runner's gait um, with digital insights. Um, and certainly so when you're thinking about how you move, um, you can see that um, this is digital data I'm gonna show here. A little bit about us, uh, we're based in Boulder, Colorado. We were founded in 2012 um, by Kunihiko Kaji and Taigo-san. Um, we also have a uh, satellite office in Tokyo. Uh, our core business is designing and manufacturing sports IT devices related to services that contribute to the advancement of sports technologies and sciences, uh, specifically endurance sports. Uh, our current uh, device Type S was launched in January at the Consumer Electronics Show, and our first applications for that were in cycling. Um, regarding cycling form, um, both in terms of performance and also uh, bike fitting. Certainly, we've been working on uh, the running form all along, and uh, we announced and launched the running MPIs about two weeks ago. Uh, in sports, we know there's a, uh, a phrase, uh, practice makes perfect. Um, we at Leoma believe that precision makes perfect. Uh, what does that mean? It means that um, Certainly you can practice, you can practice, you can practice, but certainly doing it precisely um, guided by digital insights is certainly gonna be a much better way to achieve uh, higher end performance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're focused entirely around motion analysis. Um, quantifying athlete movement gives precise numerical values to motion. This gives the ability to explain, compare, uh, and track performance, um, and also make improvements. Uh, it highlights the real differences between um, different athletes, um, in, in individual athletes, which helps uh, pinpoint structural imbalances, muscular weaknesses, and also determining the most efficient and powerful way to move. So again, we're in, we're in cycling, we're in running right now, and also visa the triathlon, um, although not swimming yet, but um, certainly in those sports, there's a lot of specific movements uh, related to efficiency and power, 
and the, the more you can maximize those or optimize those, um, certainly the better you'll be and ultimately the better performance you'll have. <clears throat> when it comes to running form analysis, why is it important? Uh, certainly the idea of running more efficiently has always been a thing. Um, and coaches through the years, athletes through the years have uh, taken some, some cues from you know, running taller, running with proper uh, posture, things like that. Um, running stronger, obviously, running faster. Ultimately, uh, everyone wants to run faster if they're training for a race. Running healthier, um, certainly uh, working out imbalances you might have. Um, injury prevention, um, certainly running to have the best form and, not, and to avoid overuse injuries is important. Tracking injury re rehabilitation is important. Um, if you have an imbalance or if you had an injury, um, or a weakness, uh, certainly you can track uh, your progress and in, in getting strength back and getting balance back um, to become the healthiest, uh, strongest runner you can. As regards to today, this is about running shoe fit and performance, um, which is kind of a new aspect of running form analysis uh, made possible through digital analytics. Um, we're kind of in the phase of our company right now, Leomo 2.0. As I said, we started in 2012 and have um, produced uh, a lot of products and uh, developed a lot of technology related to sports. Um, right now we're in a phase of 2.0, which is really uh, starting with the golden goal of aiming for optimal movement patterns. Um, and we believe this is possible both for elite athletes and also for recreational athletes, committed athletes that um, train for a marathon, train for a triathlon. Um, what does that mean? It means um, getting yourself to understand and use bioma biomechanically correct movements, physically correct movements. Um, and it's also based on, when it comes to running, the world's best runners. Does that mean you will run just like that person? No, but certainly you can uh, understand and uh, gain progress toward better form based on what we know about how efficient and how powerful those runners are. Our main theory is about maximizing your current abilities. Certainly we all come from a starting point, um, whether you're an elite athlete or whether you're a recreational athlete or somewhere in between. Um, and the idea that movement does not change uh, from the time you start to, to, goal, to a goal. So certainly you can, you can improve your form, um, but understanding the tenets of a good form and good motion can be carried through from start to finish, even when you're changing the load or changing a workout or um, you know, whether you're running a marathon or doing a, um, a workout on the track. As I mentioned earlier, we've launched our motion performance indicators. Um, these are our innovative metrics um, that break down uh, various parts of the running stride. Um, we've all been aware of uh, the phases of the running stride for a long time. Certainly, if you look at it from you know, the, the, the basic uh, tenets, it's basically a swing phase and a, and a ground contact phase, um, but broken down within that, there's initial swing, there's mid swing, terminal swing, and then obviously the initial contact the flat stance, heel up, toe off, there's a lot of different names for these things. And certainly we know that in here, when the foot comes down, there's absorption of energy, there's the transfer of energy, and then there's lift off or toe off. And certainly um, a lot of people call those a lot of different things, but uh, certainly these are the common uh, known things that, about the stride. Um, there's been a lot of basic metrics through the years um, and advanced metrics too, certainly cadence, um, the number of steps per minute, the pace, which is based on either miles or kilometers. Um, uh, stride length, the distance covered in each stride, um, the advanced metrics, uh, certainly ground contact time, how much time your foot is on the ground in that single leg stance phase. Vertical oscillation is uh, how much you're moving up and down, um, often measured at the hips, um, but uh, also an indication of efficiency or inefficiency. Um, and landing pattern, uh, where you land, rear foot, forefoot, um, certainly that's been debated through the years and, and certainly probably less of an issue, but certainly I'm um, also uh, an interesting point to understand. So Leomo's uh, metrics uh, or running performance indicators, uh, motion performance indicators um, are recoil angular range, thigh swing speed, strike angular range, heel pitch, and smoothness. Um, just looking at those words, obviously they, you know, that's, you know, a unique set of words, but uh, obviously they each uh, are tied to a specific part of the running gait. Getting back to that original graphic, um, when you look at the, the, the phases here, um, you can see where our MPIs come into play. So the period from toe off to the max foot height when, you, when your leg recoils and back is known as recoil angular range. So we're measuring this uh, range of motion here um, uh, as the foot goes back and recoils. Uh, the peak thigh speed um, is our metric for thigh swing speed. 
So how fast, what's, what's the maximum value of this leg going forward? And then uh, if you look at max shin angle, uh, which is right here to just before touchdown, the angle of touchdown, this is known as strike angular range. That's really where your, your body, your leg is setting up energy to go into the next stride. Um, obviously related to thigh swing speed, but uh, more um, tied to this angle here. Uh, if you look at the, the, that angle to touchdown and the loading phase, um, when, when a runner comes down and touches down, they're bringing um, very, very strong force, downward force into the ground, and it can turn into a very breaking moment, um, breaking energy, uh, which is a loss of energy. But uh, the quicker uh, that runner is able to get to single leg stance phase and then uh, convert that energy into forward propulsion um, is, is key. And so uh, from here to here, um, you know, the, the more you can reduce that breaking moment and then turn it into a propulsion moment, um, and, and the quicker you can do that is known as heel pitch. Um, and then obviously toe off, it begins the whole cycle once again. Um, the other metric we have is called smoothness, which is really um, a measure of the lateral movement of, of the hips, um, which we believe is a, uh, an indication of overall stability and control of the, stri <clears throat> the stride. Pardon me. Um, so those are our MPIs and kind of where they fit into the stride cycle. Uh, so the first one, recoil angular range. As I said, um, it's, it's that moment uh, of the angle, rather, of right before toe off where the shin is, and then how high, at the highest point of the foot, um, so that we're measuring that angle. The angular range of the foot and the shin, obviously from toe off, the highest point. It's also known as rear kick or the stretch shortening cycle of a stride. So certainly there's a lot of names for these um, in common terms, but uh, we call it recoil angular range. Why is it important? Um, a higher range uh, makes it easier to swing the leg during the swing phase, uh, provides better energy release and improved timing of your swing. Um, a higher range can also result in better release of energy during the ground contact and the five swing speed of the alternate leg. Uh, optimal recoil um, angular range must be maintainable. And that's, that's, that's key with all these um, MPIs is you've got to be consistent and be maintainable with them. Obviously, there's there's different, uh, different ranges for different types of runners. Um, so if you think of sprinters or middle distance runners, they might have a higher recall angular range than say a marathoner. Um, it's not just based on pace or speed, but it's certainly based on that range. Um, if you think of someone like Bernard Lagat for years was a um, 1500 meter runner and a 5,000 meter runner, um, had a really, really strong recoil angular range. Um, when he started to run marathons in the last couple of years, um, his coach really had to, to get him to back off um, and, and adjust his stride a little bit so he wasn't uh, obviously uh, having that recoil in the back so far because it's not going to be maintainable, um, even though he's been used to that for years um, uh, as a marathoner. Okay, the next one, thigh swing speed. It's pretty simple. It's the maximum speed of the thigh that it swings forward in each stride. Um, obviously, this is the counteractive movement of the recoil angular range as your one leg is going back, the other one's going forward. And so we're measuring basically the maximum speed here um, as you go forward. Why is that important? Uh, thigh swing speed helps create forward energy. Pretty, pretty straightforward, obviously. Um, but a reduction in thigh swing, thigh swing speed um, can indicate changes in the height of the foot uh, recoil and the timing of your swing. Asymmetries can also point to weaknesses, including uh, on the opposing leg. Um, I myself have a leg length imbalance, which you'll see from my data in a little bit. And certainly I can become efficient or as efficient as possible um, as we do as runners. But um, if you, once you see the, the imbalance, and certainly um, I'm not as efficient as I could be. So I, I can do my best to run and I can run track workouts and I can run a marathon. Um, you know, but if I, uh, and this is one of the whole goals of this whole um, technology, if I can get that balance, improve that balance through strength training and drills and improve um, or lessen that asymmetry, improve that balance, um, certainly that will benefit me obviously, or benefit any runner. Um, so obviously a higher uh, swing speed will maximize forward energy and the optimal level again uh, uh, for a five skater marathon is, is the one that can be maintained. Um, so obviously you think about the, the force of a sprinter or a middle distance runner, or if, if you're doing you know, six by 800 on the track, you're not gonna have that same thigh swing speed you would um, for your marathon pace um, or half marathon pace. Seems obvious, but certainly uh, it fits into the bigger picture of 
of how, how you run and how your form goes. Um, strike angular range. Um, it's range of the shin, the foot as they swing forward before you touch down. Um, it's it's a pre-activation phase um, of the uh, stretch shortening cycle. Certainly, it's it's about uh, this lunging forward of the foot um, with all that energy uh, before you touch down, before that 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 breaking moment starts. <clears throat> Why is that important? Um, it's the start of the run stride cycle and the pre-loading, um, the period for force uh, production. It allows the foot and the shin to reach a higher velocity um, prior to contact with the ground. Certainly, it's related to thigh swing speed in some respects because the thigh is moving forward, but it's obviously about the leg swinging forward, uh, lower leg swinging forward with the foot. Uh, higher velocity results in more force production to contact and ultimately more energy to send the runner forward into the next stride. And again, for long runs and races, your optimal strike angular range must be maintained. Heel pitch. This is one I, I think I've talked about already, but uh, heel pitch is that is that uh, measurement of how quickly the loading of the vertical downward force um, can be transferred into the phase that converts into propulsion. So again, your foot comes down, you go to a single leg stance phase, and then you're flat, and then you start to heel up and then toe off. Um, within here, there's downward energy here, there's obviously upward energy here. And so heel pitch is the ability to quickly and very efficiently um, convert that energy. Um, and and in, in the process of that, certainly lose less energy um, in those breaking moments. Um, it is not about ground contact time because uh, it's, it's measured um, as, a, as a percentage of ground contact time, which is really from touchdown to toe off. Um, heel pitch is really the conversion phase, which is right in here. Let's look at this graphic. Um, heel pitch can vary, uh, obviously, between runners. Here's just an interesting graph from some of our research. Um, uh, the, the purple and the blue lines are most important here, 203 marathoner and 207 marathoner. And the key to look at here is um, the, uh, the peak of, of, of heel pitch is really uh, obviously showing how efficient that, that, that marathoner can turn over and convert that energy from touchdown to uh, single leg stance and almost lift, lift off. And so it's obviously different than the 207 marathoner, um, even though the rest of the stride cycle appears to be almost the same that peak value is, is quicker um, and shows that that two or three marathoner is more efficient. Um, certainly uh, for of course a marathon, that efficiency can be gained in, uh, you know, micro bits of energy, not lost. And um, certainly uh, if you're a 3.30 marathon or a three hour marathon or whatever, obviously that can be even greater. Um, but obviously this is just showing between two of the runners we studied here. So why is heel pitch important? Um, again, a runner must be able to quickly store and release energy upon uh, contact with the ground. Um, elite runners are able to store and release energy faster, generally speaking, um, resulting in faster transfer propulsion and a better uh, heel pitch score. A lower heel pitch score is an indication you are more efficiently converting that energy. Um, obviously a higher, uh, higher score would mean, mean you're spending a lot more time on the ground, you're probably losing a lot of energy in the braking moment and you're, um, you're not getting off the ground quick enough. Um, that's obviously the, the, the ground contact time, but certainly even uh, the recreational runner, the, the three hour, 3.30, um, four hour marathon, can improve that obviously and benefit. The last of the MPIs is smoothness. Um, again, measures uh, the smoothness of a runner's lateral motion at the hips. Um, why is that important? Uh, it's important because it re uh, reflects dynamic control of running movement. Um, this is the MPI we believe covers uh, kind of the whole stride cycle. Um, more smoothness or a lower score, the flexibility of the athlete to maintain coordination and synchronization. So there's a lot that goes into it, but certainly um, the more smooth you can be, the less waggle in your hips, um, uh, certainly the better off it'll be. Um, it can get dramatically worse with fatigue um, as run goes on, which is um, similar, different to vertical oscillation, which does not get dramatically worse, but uh, certainly smoothness does. If you think about um, you know, if you get tired when you're on a run and your arms drop or your arms uh, waggle more, then your hips are going to move more. And certainly um, that's going to be uh, less efficient um, if you think about that in your, in your marathon. In the last six miles of the marathon, the reason it's so bad is because um, obviously when you get tired, your form falls apart. And when your form falls apart, um, your smoothness uh, gets worse. Uh, here's an example again of uh, two of the people we studied. Certainly, if you think about um, smoothness um, and maintaining smoothness and having a low score, uh, two or three marathon can be smooth the whole way through, right? And you can see even with fatigue that, that that's increasing. But 
if you look at, uh, you know, someone through a marathon or who might have, you know, uh, been severely impact, impacted by fatigue, uh, obviously that smoothness uh, can go way up and also lead to, you know, uh, again, really, really inefficient running. Um, okay, so now we're at the use case, um, which is the running shoe data comparison. Um, so based on all the metrics, the MPIs I just mentioned, uh, we took upon uh, this study of three different running shoes. Um, the objective was to really see how runners gait changes in similar but different shoes at slow tempo and fast speeds. We chose three different distance racing shoes with carbon fiber plates. Um, obviously, carbon fiber shoes are kind of all the rage the last couple of years. Um, and there's probably eight to 10 of them out there now. We just chose three. Uh, the Brooks Hyperion Elite, uh, the Nike Vaporfly 4% Flynet, and the ASIC Meta Racer. Um, obviously, there's other shoes out there. The Vaporfly, there's the Bex Percent, there's uh, um, the Endorphin Elite from Saucony. So, and then also the Hyperion Elite 2 is coming out soon, too. So it doesn't really matter um, kind of which ones we chose, but certainly this is uh, a collection of obviously some of the shoes that have made an impact um, and been um, front and center the last uh, year and a half or so. The test protocol involved running 400 meters at three different paces on each shoe. Um, and the test subject, that's me, ran each shoe approximately 120 seconds, so slow pace, eight minutes per mile, 100 seconds, which is kind of a, kind of a tempo pace, 640 per mile, and then a faster pace, a 520 pace, 80 seconds per lap. Um, each uh, lap had uh, three minutes rest, so fatigue was not really an issue. Um, and they were all done within uh, one session. Uh, I did repeat this test a couple times um, on different days, but certainly uh, with the same protocol. Real quick about the shoes. Um, you know, these shoes <clears throat> all have a similar, but slightly different uh, designs. Um, the key is that they all have some sort of foam, uh, uh, usually thicker foam with a carbon fiber plate built into the, uh, embedded in the, in the, in the midsole. Um, 6.9 ounces for the Brooks shoe, uh, has an eight millimeter offset. Um, so still, still pretty thick in the forefoot. Um, and some of these, some of these observations here will be interesting when we look at the data. Um, it, it definitely feels snug and tight in the heel, and wider, looser in the forefoot. You can see that by the shape as well. Uh, the sensation uh, feels moderately soft at slower speeds, um, but it then tends to feel moderately firm at faster speeds. Um, if you've been in a lot of running shoes, you can sense that uh, when you when you when you engage a shoe it will feel different at different different paces and different speeds partially by where you're striking but also partially by how much force you're putting into it <clears throat> the nike vaporfly four percent um is an interesting shoe certainly same wheelhouse of uh weight um has a little bit higher uh heel toe offset um so certainly um higher than rear and sorry about the specs here that's, that's actually inaccurate but um it is a 10 millimeter drop um, there is a carbon fiber plate roughly around this black line. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it feels uh, snug to tight, like most Nike shoes do, uh, almost like a track spike. Um, and that's kind of just uh, uh, by design, I think, with Nike. Um, it feels very, very soft at slower speeds. This foam is super, super soft if you get been in these shoes. Um, so when you're running slow paces, either the eight-minute pace or if you're on recovery pace or jog pace, it feels very soft. Obviously, when you're running those paces, you're heel striking a lot more. And um, so you're really kind of bottoming out that foam or close to bottoming out that foam. Um, the idea is when you run faster, it feels soft, but it feels springier because you're probably not impacting as much on the heel. You're probably landing in here or much more quickly engaging that plate and rolling forward. Um, and one of the things that uh, seems to be talked about is these aren't, these aren't acting as springs necessarily, they're actually acting as levers. Um, I think that when you're engaging the foam and then you're getting to this um, carbon fiber plate, you're really kind of uh, rolling through. And there's been studies that show that uh, there's less energy use in the forefoot um, as you lift off. But that's um, kind of common to all these shoes. Uh, the last shoe is the A6 Meta Racer, which came out um, this spring for the elite athletes. I think it hits retail in a couple of weeks. Um, 6.7 ounces. Again, same kind of wheelhouse. Um, different design, though. Uh, nine millimeter uh, offset. Um, but obviously you can see there's quite a bit of, of toe spring here. So when you rock forward, obviously um, you get a different sensation, but there's obviously a good amount of uh, foam in the heel. Uh, it definitely feels um, snug and tight from heel to toe, um, similar to the Nike. Um, so no, no real wiggle room in the forefoot for toes. Um, the sensation, it feels moderately soft, slower speeds. And then it feels, again, it feels firmer um, and springier at faster speeds. Um, 
and it's similar uh, sensations to the Nike shoe are, but definitely it's firmer in the back than the Nike foam. The Nike foam is super soft. Um, okay, so here's kind of a look at uh, some of the um, key MPI data. And I know this is kind of overwhelming. You're seeing a lot of data here. Um, but I think some of the key takeaways are, are pretty clear. Um, so with the, the Brooks shoe, um, here's the different paces. Here's, here's the data here. Um, the recoil uh, angular range, um, which is in that rear um, rear, rear uh, foot recoil, um, was very good at all speeds. And we'll see this in a different comparison chart uh, here. Uh, the heel pitch strike uh, angular range and thigh swing speed improved at faster speeds. So uh, the performance of the shoe is better um, at higher speeds. Um, and then the left, right, and balance, as you can see, and this is, this is so this is, um, if you can see these numbers are different, just left and right of each one of these. You can see that I have uh, a pretty dramatic leg length and balance, um, which is a product of many things. Um, probably started when I was a track athlete as a kid. I had a stronger right leg than left. Um, I've also been uh, less diligent about my track training, although I still run on the track, but um, I do a lot more trail running. Um, in trail running, uh, you have a lead leg often that does most of the work. That's my right leg again. And then lastly, about 12 years ago, I had a, a complete rupture of my left Achilles tendon, and so my left side is much weaker. So um, for better or for worse, all of that weakness has gone to my left side, and so my right leg does more of the work. My right leg is stronger. My le right leg is um, certainly called on a lot more. So that results in, um, for me, dramatic differences. But if you studied uh, running gait at all, you know that everyone has some sort of imbalance. If you look at um, you know, the 10,000 meter runners, in the Olympics and World Championships, um, everyone has uh, form, you know, uh, functions that, 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 you know, look different. They might have an arm waggle or whatever else. And, and certainly there's the reason that arm is waggling because they're in balance somewhere. But so the point is that every runner has some imbalances that can be improved. Um, obviously me, for sure, um, as you can see them here um, with the differences, some great, some not so great. Um, but the, the key is that with this technology, you can certainly identify them and then work on doing drills and strength to, um, to kind of narrow those imbalances. Anyway, um, but they were um, they were dramatic at the faster speeds. So um, obviously in here, I was uh, forcing myself to work harder um, on one leg um, with that shoe. The uh, <clears throat> Nike Vaporfly 4%, um, obviously again, there's a whole plethora of data here. Um, heel pitch, uh, strike angular range and thigh swing speed improved with faster speed. Um, it probably had this shoe probably had the best overall data of the three shoes at tempo pace, marathon pace. So it's that 640 marathon pace, which is roughly 257 um, marathon, uh, which is fairly realistic for what I would hope to, to run uh, if I were training for a marathon um, in the next six to eight months. Um, those uh, data figures were pretty strong. Um, it didn't have exceptional recoil um, angular range compared to other shoes, which is interesting. I think that has a lot to do with the really soft foam in the back. Um, so in other words, basically my, my leg wasn't coming up um, as high, the range wasn't as great on my rear heel kick. But if you look at uh, thigh swing speed, thigh swing speed was exceptional in the Nike. So um, despite the fact that my, my rear leg wasn't coming back that far, um, as it went forward, it, it, was, it was the fastest going forward. Um, interesting to note. <clears throat> uh, the ASIC shoe, um, Again, there are imbalances, but uh, I think the, one of the keys here with the left-right imbalances were a low to moderate with the ASIC shoe, which is an interesting point as well. Um, recoil, uh, angular range, heel pitch, uh, strike angular range, and thigh swing speed all improve with faster speeds, um, which is a good thing. I think it's more efficient, um, better performance at faster speeds. Uh, the recoil angular range was exceptional um, at higher speeds, and so was thigh swing speed. Um, so obviously what we're seeing here is uh, obviously Again, different shoes performing differently based on um, my uh, my anatomy, my fitness, and everything else, and putting these through the, the same paces for each one. Um, so here's looking at the shoes at the slow pace. Um, you can see that cadence and stride length were almost identical for each shoe, um, but recoil angular range, which again is the the rear kick of the of the, of the leg, um, obviously very strong with Brooks and Asics. Um, again, you're seeing my imbalance here, right? So one of my legs is not going back as far, um, which is, means I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty torqued in my hips, which I've, I've known for years um, and certainly it's to work on. Um, the recoil angular range is a little bit better closer here, um, but it's not, uh, um, 
it's not, I, I didn't get as far back with the Nike. Like I said, I think it has a lot to do with that super soft thumb. Uh, heel pitch, the ability to um, convert that downward energy into forward energy. Um, very similar in all these shoes, which is interesting. It's a slower speed. So um, maybe not a lot to make of that at eight minute pace um, because you're, you're, you're doing the simple act of just going down and coming up around the same pace. Um, not a lot of performance coming out of the shoe or the foam maybe. Um, Strike angular range, which is that lower leg going forward. Uh, Nike was the better one here. So obviously um, that's related maybe, like I said, to um, thigh swing speed, but certainly just on, on its own, I was able to, to, to go forward more with my lower leg or faster, better, um, and put more energy into my um, stride. As I said, thigh swing speed, uh, Nike and Asics were the best. Um, it's slower speed. Um, and then the smoothest score, Nike was the smoothest. Um, so interesting takeaways there, obviously, um, at the slower speed. At the, at the tempo pace, which is, again, roughly 257 marathon pace, 640 per mile. I think that's about right. Um, uh, obviously, the run cadence and stride length were similar again. Um, the recoil, uh, certainly ASICs uh, excelled here, um, even though we still see those imbalances. Um, but Nike really excelled uh, in, in the heel pitch. And so we can start to see the differences where Nike, the Nike shoe, I was able to turn over that energy quicker um, at a slightly faster pace. Um, and then range, again, you can see where my imbalances are coming out. Um, and again, any, any athlete, any runner would see these imbalances. And certainly you'd, you'd want to, in my case, uh, I need to fix and work on my um, leg length imbalance. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's certainly interesting that I can, my left leg goes back pretty far, my right leg does not. Thigh swing speed, again, uh, Nike and Asics were the two the two leaders in that, um, as it relates to that. Uh, let's see here, moving on, get the water here. So the fastest pace, um, which is again, not super fast, but uh, for 80 second uh, 400s, but 520 mile pace, um, similar cadence, similar stride length, um, but you can see then the differences in recoil, um, angular range. Uh, obviously the ASIC shoe, I was able to get much better range. Again, still that imbalance, which is inherent to me, but if you look at the average of those, obviously that's um, that's a better range uh, than uh, than the Brooks, which did pretty well, and, and then Nike not quite as well. Again, heel pitch. Um, Nike's probably the leader of these of these so similar heel pitches, um, and then strike angular range again, more forward motion um, from more forward energy for the Brooks and the Nike shoe, um, but um, much greater uh, thigh swing speed from the Nike and the Asics. So here's a look at all, all the data overall, um, three shoes and three paces. Obviously it's a lot of data here, but um, certainly there's uh, some of the shoes uh, excel in different, different areas um, more than others. Um, uh, <clears throat> I've already been through the shoes, but uh, certainly you can understand that uh, the recoil uh, angular range, the rear leg kick uh, was significantly higher, better than the Brooks and Asics than the Nike. I think we said that a couple times. Um, certainly potentially better efficiency. Um, again, that's potentially related to Nike's super soft foam because um, these, these foams are both um, a little bit firmer. Heel pitch, the ability to turn over um, was similar in all shoes, um, but Nike had the better uh, value at the tempo or marathon pace. Um, the strike angular range, which was the propulsive force generation through the lower leg was best in the Nike shoe, um, but the Brooks is comparable at the fastest pace. Thigh swing speed is greater with the Nike shoe, but not surprisingly, um, it also had a high strike angular range. So what's the best shoe? Um, that kind of is up for debate, uh, I guess for the marathon, uh, certainly some of the values of the Nike would show that it's good. Um, although the, uh, based on some of the efficiency and energy return um, uh, scores, but uh, maybe not so because the left right imbalances were so great. Um, the Nike shoe produced a lower heel pitch. So certainly, um, I could turn over quicker and, and be more efficient in that uh, downward strike to forward toe off. Um, but again, the imbalances were pretty, pretty big, um, which from an uh, overuse injury uh, point of view could be, could be an issue. I'm not a PT or a medic at all, but certainly um, we know that uh, those imbalances can lead to things that uh, cause strains and pains and things like that. So <clears throat> kind of summarizing this, um, you know, we know that different shoes um, produce different mechanics. Every running shoe is uh, constructed differently. Every runner runs differently. Um, there's no industry standards when it comes to 
shoe design, size, shape. Um, every company uses different lasts. Um, certainly has their own dimensions um, for what they what they uh, create their shoes, how they create their shoes. Um, we know the evolution of foams um, is huge right now. It's quickly advancing. Uh, certainly, even in the last couple of years and coming forward, um, obviously that plays a big role in performance, stability, and durability. I think you've seen some of the even shoes change in the last couple of years. Um, for example, that original four percent and the one I showed there um, that wasn't very stable in the in the Rear foot, the Nike Next Percent um, was made so it's much more stable. Um, uh, so that means it's a little more democratic. So if you're not an elite um, 203, 202 marathoner, you're, or even 210 marathoner, you're able to uh, get more stability uh, depending on where you land. Um, uh, obviously, new, new design paradigms have happened in the last couple of years. Carbon fiber plates, embedded midsoles, new stability mechanisms certainly are changing the way shoes are made. Um, as we're getting away from, for example, uh, you know, thicker medial posts uh, to control pronation. So obviously a lot going on with running shoes, um, more so than ever before, a lot of changes, a lot of unknowns, um, uh, and also a lot of really good shoes too. Uh, running shoe fitting, um, shoe fitting 101. Um, uh, we know that uh, it's in an exact science. Every runner moves differently um, based on their anatomical structure, their fitness, mechanics, injury history, of course, their shoes too. Uh, up until now, it's required an expert shoe fitter um, to do a visual assessment um, and certainly working with that runner to understand kind of that, that brain foot proprioception. Um, in the best case, um, you know, I know a lot of good shoe fitters and I respect a lot. And certainly this is a photo from In Motion Running in Boulder um, where Mark Plachis, um has known to be kind of a shoe whisperer. Uh, at, the, at the best case, uh, certainly those people can do pretty well for, based on their experience and their um, knowledge of how, how the body moves. Um, but we know too that um, plenty of people buy shoes online, plenty of people buy shoes in different places, um, and also people shop for you know color and brand and everything else. And so in those cases, especially when you're not um, involved with an expert shoe fitter, you're maybe not getting the right shoe for you. Um, and, and, and you know there's really a lot of unknowns still. Um, to the point here that a lot of runners uh, use different shoes for different types of running, and they should. Um, I've always said a good quiver of shoes is, is a great thing, but certainly with, for your long run, for your speed training workouts, recovery run, and racing, certainly uh, there's different shoes for all those things. They might be similar shoes, um, but there but they're, uh, are better shoes uh, for each of those things. I know a lot of people will take one shoe and make it their workout workhorse do everything shoe. Uh, might be a Nike Pegasus, but uh, certainly um, there's ways to have better performance out of different shoes. Um, <clears throat> we know the three biggest detractors in running um, are poor fitness, um, wrong shoe choices, and overuse injuries. Uh, those can all be related. Um, if you're not fit and then you're wrong shoe, you're not going to really want to train that much and you might get hurt. Um, if you get hurt, you're not going to be motivated to get fit. Um, so it's kind of like a cyclical thing where, um, you know, one can feed negatively or positively, um, you know, to your overall performance and experience in running. So where does Leoma Run play in? Um, <clears throat> Leoma Run technology offers digital insights um, into a runner's stride, as I showed earlier with the data. And again, the data obviously is a lot of numbers, and this is all new to everybody, but certainly it does show exactly how my uh, parts of my stride were performing, um, and especially uh, how they were different, either slightly different or vastly different in, in different shoes. Uh, Leoma Run motion performance data provides visual, visualization of a runner's gait, um, allowing a runner or a coach or a shoe fitter see how a runner moves at different phases of the stride cycle um, or where a runner is in balance or weak. Uh, knowing the runner's uh, current MPI data um, can help a shoe fitter or a runner understand and optimize the process of getting to a shoe that works best for them, both for uh, their stride, but also certainly for the types of running they're doing. And, um, you know, obviously that leads to getting their correct shoes. Uh, if you go to a typical running store, there's there's often a shoe wall with you know 100 100 different shoes, and again, there's so many variables in every piece of a shoe, how they're built, um, the size, the shape, the width, the type of the foam, uh, how it's secured, how it fits once you lace it up, things like that. Uh, so Leoma Run uh, technology and shoe fitting um, is a pr precise solution. Um, we're creating a retail program that will. Ideally start with a pilot program at a store and include the acquisition of runner's motion data at the time of purchase. Um, so then uh, the runner and the retailer can understand and monitor uh, that data and how they're moving 
how their stride is uh, interacting in specific parts of their stride um, as the runner becomes more fit or, or less fit. Um, and also as the shoes wear out, certainly we know that um, the performance of a new shoe uh, versus the performance of a shoe with three or 400 miles, obviously can be vastly different as the, uh, the foam breaks down or different parts break down. Um, but this, uh, this retail solution we're creating uh, can lead to better shoe fitting options uh, for different types of running, long runs, speed training, recovery, as I mentioned before. Um, is also where uh, awareness of when a shoe should be replaced. Um, you know, now we go by feel, and you know, unfortunately, one of the one of the key understandings of when a shoe needs to be replaced is when you start getting aches and pains that weren't there when you started running in that shoe. You know, so that could be you know a little bit of tendonitis, things like that. Um, certainly, understanding the data um, ahead of time or or concurrently can can avoid those things, and certainly that's one another way that we can uh, hopefully avert uh, overuse injuries. Um, also, just understanding different types of shoes um, and how they're how they perform with you and how you run. If you recall the data of the shoes I tested, uh, certainly there were different um, different different metrics that that, that uh, performed well in different scenarios. Um, and so, from that point of view, a shoe with a very high recoil um, angular range. So again, that rear heel kick is probably not ideal for a marathon, um, but it might be good for 5K, 10K faster running intervals. Um, a shoe that produces a lower recoil um, angular range, but also a better heel pitch, that, that efficiency from turning over um, from downward energy to forward energy um, could be better for a half marathon or marathon. Um, and there's plenty of you know, uh, instances where you can uh, look at the data and understand that. Uh, okay, so I'll get into the last thing here is this is all based on a type S for running. Uh, type S is the head unit here um, with, um, and then we have uh, five, uh, motion sensors to go with it. And I'll just kind of show you how this is set up and how how we track the data. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Type S can track all the typical running data, um, speed, pace, cadence, distance. Um, it pairs with ANC Plus devices. Uh, so if you're using a heart rate monitor, you can get heart rate data. Um, it is Wi-Fi enabled. Um, there are two Bluetooth chips in it, um, one specifically for the sensors. Um, so there's always a connection to one of the chips for our five sensors. And then also there's a third party for third party devices if you're wearing wireless headphones, for example. Uh, there's an auto sync feature that will connect your data to Training Peaks or Strava if you're already training with those. And the unit is also can be a fully functioning Android phone based on the Android platform. Um, and certainly with a SIM card, it can be uh, your go everything, you know, do everything tool, um, texting, calls, emails, et cetera. Um, uh, the biggest and most important thing we're talking about today is the, the real-time motion analysis. Um, you can understand and get the data um, as, you're, as you're working out or as you're running to understand kind of where your form is. Um, obviously, we have, I said, there's, there's five IMU sensors that go on the body. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but you can see them here placed here on this runner. Um, and you can get uh, feedback in real time. That's, that's what's key. So, obviously, you're getting the data, getting the raw data from uh, the motion and then uh, being converted through the, the Type S unit. Uh, you can use the MPI data to improve technique, balance, efficiency, and pace. That's kind of what I've been saying all the way through. Um, certainly injury prevention, injury recovery analysis. Um, and then the data can be uh, both viewed on the, on the app, on the product, and also can be viewed post-run um, versus the web app. I'll get to that one second here. So as far as uh, sensor placement goes, um, these bolded uh, uh, names here are our five MPIs, and uh, this is how we track data. So we have um, shoe clips uh, for the shoes, and so um, there's typically one sensor on each shoe, um, also on the top of the thigh, and also on the pelvis. Uh, this is maybe uh, showing the front, but actually on the back of sacrum is where the other, other uh, sensor goes. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, wearing the device, we have an armband, a waistband. Um, the Type S device is uh, small, it's about 110 grams. It's the size and weight of about three energy gels. You stack three energy gels together, that's what it would be. Um, and then obviously here's an example of our uh, shoe clips for the sensors. And then we have adhesives for uh, other parts of the body. So when you're putting them on your thighs or uh, your sacrum, this is a double-sided uh, adhesive that uh, sticks the Fix the sensor on, on your body. Um, so here's a, here's a, an example of the application um, uh, on the on the system. You can see all this data: your pace, distance, smoothness, 
various MPIs. So when you're running, you can understand what the data is uh, telling you um, on the fly in real time. And so you can make um, postural adjustments, uh, form changes, um, both uh, to understand it, but also for performance. Um, and then you can also see the data uh, that you're, of your work out there. Uh, then once on the web application, um, it's really your dashboard for everything to compare and analyze all your workouts um, and, and graph your workouts, obviously with maps too, but uh, you can compare uh, and look at deep, deep detail of the workout you just did, like the ones I was showing you before, um, or you can compare, you know, if you're a marathoner and you're doing an eight mile tempo run every Tuesday, you know, whatever, you can, you can compare that data um, uh, uh, side by side. Um, so it's really a place to analyze both uh, your running data, but also your motion data as well. Um, again, here's kind of look at uh, some of the graphs you would see um, uh, from our MPIs. And uh, why is it important? You, again, you're observing motion trends with your, your increasing speed, uh, identifying weak points, uh, thresholds in motion. You can measure and track imbalances in movement um, uh, through these MPIs. Um, that's an example of what you would see. Um, Here's an example on the bottom of smoothness. Obviously, this runner is running um, with some kind of workout here, and obviously not very smooth here, um, uh, whereas cycling speed is increasing um, as this runner gets faster here. So you can really understand this in relation to um, the various parts of your stride. <clears throat> Live Video Sync is a unique program we have um, that we developed two years ago. It works with our Type S, but also our Type R device, um, and uh, tracks video through an iPad camera. This could be a very good application for a running retailer. Um, I know some running retailers use iPad cameras to do video analysis of runners on treadmills in their stores. This would allow um, that video to be played um, and also understand the data exactly as it's happening. So these are examples of MPIs that certainly show um, kind of how that um, runner is moving. This happens to be Lopez Lamar here uh, in a track workout. But it certainly gives that, uh, that integrated uh, visual look at the data, certainly with the video and the data side by side. Um, there's a watch application. Uh, if you have a, a, a Wear OS uh, watch, uh, for example, the 207, um, you can uh, install the Leomo app and uh, certainly see your activity um, on the watch, um, see the running MPI data, um, time, pace, heart rate, all those things. That's an important thing, obviously. And then lastly, uh, the Type S comes in two different uh, packages. Um, obviously, the difference here is two sensors or five sensors. Um, and the only limiting factor if you have two sensors is obviously you're not gonna track as much complete data um, in one workout. Um, you know, having five sensors allows you to track data for all the MPI at once, as opposed to you have to really understand and, and place um, these two sensors based on the, on the data you wanted to get. But obviously with all five, you can get all the data right in one small swoop. So that is uh, <clears throat> the overview of kind of the running shoe comparison. Um, thank you for participating and, and checking in. There's a lot more information on our website, liomo.io. Um, certainly follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We also have a Liomo running community Facebook page that uh, is tied to people interacting about um, running gate analysis and certainly using our technologies.